Please turn now in the Gospel of Mark to Mark chapter 4. Uh, we finished Galatians last week. Um, somebody else is preaching next week, so we'll begin a, a new series the week I get back. Um, but we're just going to have a, a one off sermon here on this parable of our Lord, and I hope that it's um, just a little bit of an encouragement to us. So I'm going to um, pray and then I'll read God's word. So let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you that you are life and that you give everlasting life. And we know, O oh God, that those who believe on your word shall have and shall know that life. And so we pray that the Spirit would give us faith to you believe, and that you would also give us that gift of illumination to see the truth that is revealed here. And we pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged and emboldened through the teaching of Christ as he gives it to us in this section of his word. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark chapter 4 and verse 30. The Lord Jesus Christ said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Amen. So we should never despise the day of small things. But it is tempting, isn't it? Whether you consider the work of God within your own life or whether you consider the corporate work of God in our church, it is tempting to despise the day of small things. We as a church would be pitiable in the world's eyes and we'd also be pitiable in many Christians' eyes. There's no doubt that we're many to visit here and maybe in your own hearts this evening you think, what is the point of continuing in this puny and tiny little congregation? Why not go find somewhere else that's bigger and stronger and better and has a nice band and flashing lights and all of the things that we go after in our flesh? But the reason is this, that God uses the small and the insignificant to do the most amazing and glorious of things. That's why we should never despise the day of small things. So here our Savior talks about his kingdom, verse 30. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God, and with what parable shall we picture it? Now the kingdom of God we've read about in Daniel, we read about in Isaiah, we read about in the Psalms. It is the great messianic kingdom that is promised through the scriptures of old. The kingdom of God is the rule of the anointed king, the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. It principally right now happens within the church, but it's not limited to the bricks and mortar of the church. The kingdom of God extends through the organic life of the church. 
when Christians go out and they act in a Christ-like manner and they speak the word of Christ, there the kingdom of God is present with power through the Holy Spirit in his people. The kingdom of God is the rule of Christ, principally through the church, but it also uh, extends to the consummation of the kingdom. The kingdom has now come with power. It is still present with power in the church, but the kingdom will be finished at the time when the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ fills the entire earth. When Jesus comes back and the earth is renewed and the heavens and the earth become one in the new heavens and the new earth. That is the kingdom of God. And what does he liken the kingdom of God to? That's his question. This incredible work that has been promised. This glorious kingdom which will span throughout all of history and down through eternity. How shall I describe it to my disciples, Jesus asks. And you might imagine he would say, well, the kingdom of God is like a mighty fortress with six-foot steel-enforced walls, with a moat that is filled with leviathans and that has 10,000 archers on its walls. But instead, he says that the kingdom of God, verse 31, is like a mustard seed. It is like a mustard seed which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. The greatest, the most powerful work of God on earth is, he says, like a mustard seed, smaller than all the seeds of the earth. Now, to liken it to a seed is surprising, but especially to liken it to a mustard seed is even more surprising. Of all the kind of seeds that would be planted by the disciples and in that known world, the mustard seed was one of the smallest and that's what he's saying to them. You think of all of those garden variety seeds that you might scatter in your field, on your property, in your land, and the kingdom of God is like one of them. Which one? The very smallest. The one that is almost invisible to the human eye, like a grain of sand. That's what my kingdom is like. But of course, they know naturally what Jesus goes on to say, that though it appears as a mere grain, it becomes something much more profound and powerful and visible with the passage of time. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And this is true from almost a speck of dust. The mustard seed would grow up to be larger than all of the other domestic plants. It would grow to a height of about 10 feet, almost like, well, like a big tree. And it would shoot out wide branches and it would have thick leaves and it would be full of seeds and nutrients so that the birds of the air just loved it and they would come and they would find their resting place within the tree. They would be sheltered from the sun, and they would have food as they fed upon the seeds. And this is what he says his kingdom is like. Insignificant, almost invisible to the human eye, and yet it grows and it grows and it grows, and it becomes this great resting place, a place of refuge, a place of nourishment. But it begins and often appears insignificant. And the picture that he uses here is not only contemporary and familiar to the disciples, but the Lord here draws upon prophetic imagery. And so in the prophet Ezekiel, and Ezekiel chapter 17, the Lord, uh, God there speaks through the prophet to describe the future restoration of Israel. And he describes it in these words, Ezekiel 17 and verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. 
I will crop off one of the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it, and it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. In the shadow of its branches they will dwell, and all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree, and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing on an image that was given to him through the prophet Ezekiel, which describes the reunification and the prospering of the nation of Israel in the exact same way. From a little sprig, in this case, Israel would grow up to be a mighty tree and the birds of the air would come and they would find their rest in its shade. Now, the reason we go back to Ezekiel here is not just because it's in the background of the Savior's teaching, but because it helps us to understand at the full extent of the parable. What is it that the, that, that the birds represent? And that's one of the questions that commentators wrestle with. Well, Ezekiel gives us the answer. He uses here the image of the birds coming and resting in the tree, but he uses the same picture later on in the prophecy in Ezekiel 31 to describe the nation of Egypt. And he says there with the same language that all of the birds of the heaven made their nests in its boughs, under its branches, all the beasts of the field brought forth their young, and in its shadow all great nations made their home. And so when Ezekiel prophesies of the downfall of the great nation of Egypt, he says it was that resting place for the nations. That's what the birds represent. And so when you come back to Ezekiel 17 and you come to the parable that Jesus is teaching, what's he showing us? He's showing us the picture of the long-awaited seed. He's showing us the picture of the seed of the woman who would prosper over the seed of the evil one. He's showing us the picture of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant that in you the families of the earth would be blessed. Oh, in Genesis 22, in your seed all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. He's showing to us the familiar tale of God using the weak and the contemptible things to bring about the wonderful. Just as we saw it in Daniel chapter 2. All of these other kingdoms represented with precious, valuable metals of gold and silver and iron and bronze. But then there is this unlikely candidate, a piece of rock cut out from a mountain without the properties, the visible properties of strength that gold and the other metals have. And it crushes all of those metals to a fine powder and it blows them away like chaff. Meanwhile, it expands and it grows throughout the entire world. And here is what Jesus is teaching us in the parable, that the kingdom of God begins and often appears small and insignificant, but it is determined to be the largest and most significant of all the kingdoms of the earth. It is determined to be a resting place for the nations where people from every tribe, nation, and tongue might come in and find their nourishment and find their refuge under the wings of the kingdom of God. The parable teaches a movement from humiliation to exaltation, from weakness to strength, from shame to glory, and from death to resurrection. Here in the parable is the story of Jesus Christ. Who is the seed? The seed is Christ, Paul says to the Galatians. We shouldn't be misled by the fact that the seed is previously used to describe the word of God, or that later on the seed of the mustard is used to describe faith. Here, very clearly, the seed is Jesus Christ. The same word is used uh, for the seed that goes into the earth, for the seed that comes forth from man. There's a deliberate double meaning here. It is the seed in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It is Jesus Christ who, like the seed, is scattered 
to the earth and appears less significant than any other. The scattering of the seed here to the ground describes to us the incarnation of our Lord and all of that estate of humiliation down to his death and his burial in the ground. It is from his coming down and clothing himself with weakness. It is from him being from this family of no reputation in Nazareth, being born in a manger, from his contemptible death on the cross, and from the apparent defeat of his body in the grave, that he then rose up again victorious. And even when he rose, there was Jesus and there were his disciples. No match for the Roman Empire, you might think. And yet, nevertheless, from that gathering of disciples and from the outpouring of the Spirit of God at Pentecost, the church began to grow into their hundreds and into their thousands and into their tens of thousands. The gospel spread into Asia and throughout Europe and parts of Africa. And down through the centuries, it has continued to spread. But it all began with one insignificant seed And yet it has become this great tree in which the nations have found their blessing. The Roman Empire has passed, just like the Babylonians, just like the Assyrians, just like the Medo-Persians, just like the Greeks. But the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ has endured down through the ages and will endure to all eternity. One day the Lord Jesus Christ will come back. And all of his enemies, wherever they are found, will be cast into the lake of fire. And his people will be gathered, the earth renewed, and he will rule on this earth forever and ever. And we will see him, and we will dwell in his light, and we will delight in his kingdom. But it all begins, and it often appears throughout the history of the church, as though nothing is happening through people who are considered nobodies. But from nothing and through nobodies, God establishes his kingdom. And why is it that Jesus shares this parable to his disciples? Well, it's because his church will appear weak and they'll feel their weakness. But he wants them to know that they should never lose heart. This is his mode of working, that he uses that which is visibly weak to accomplish that which is immeasurably strong, immeasurably mighty, immeasurably glorious. And what he doesn't want to happen is for his disciples to be caught out by the outward strength of the kingdoms and of the customs and of the peoples of this earth. He doesn't want them to be allured by the systems of this world. As they are gathering in their weak house churches, as they are persecuted by the Roman Empire and by their own Jewish brothers and sisters, he doesn't want them to run to that which is established. He doesn't want them to abandon their faith. What he wants them to know is, by God's design, this is how it will be. It will look as though nothing is happening. You will appear weak. You'll feel weak. But nevertheless, I am growing my kingdom and I will have victory. And so whatever you do, no matter how discouraged you are by the outward appearance of the church, he says, continue to trust in me. Continue to abide in me. For I am that mustard seed. I appear as nothing in the world. But in me you will find your refuge. In me you will find your shade. In me you will find your nourishment. Abide in Christ is the message, as he says in John 15 and verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Should you turn away from the work of Christ, you would have no blessing. But rest in the contemptible one, and you will find your blessing now and for all eternity. 
And so that's the first reason that Jesus shares this with his disciples. But the second reason is this, that in Jesus' story, the disciples see and we see our story as his body. We are like the mustard seed because we are part of the mustard seed. The gospel that we take out to the nations is foolishness to the Greeks. The weapons of our warfare, though our foes are many and though our foes are strong, appear weak. We have the word of God and we have our prayers and we have the sacrament of baptism, a bit of water and some bread and some wine. And we find ourselves in weakness. We find ourselves derided by the world, feeling utterly insignificant. Don't you feel like a mustard seed? Don't you feel like your best efforts have little effect? That our prayers are not answered and that we're going nowhere? All too often we feel like a mustard seed, but that is by God's design. And the fact that it is by God's design means that we should never despise the day of small things because it is God who uses the humble, the small, and the insignificant to do the great things. We shouldn't despise our position right now. We shouldn't despise the fact that there are empty chairs and people don't turn up to our meetings. We shouldn't despise the fact that we try to reach the people of Fulwell and the wider area and nobody responds. Because all too often God works through these tiny, seemingly insignificant actions. But they are all part of his plan and purposes. However small our role is, and however small your role is in the kingdom, by faith, you are one with Jesus Christ. And everything that you do and everything that is done through you, though it be very, very, very small, is a tiny part of that one magnificent work of Christ. If you are part of Christ, then you are part of that mustard seed and of that great tree that is growing. And so though you may feel that you have this drop in the ocean effect, that effect is one part of the kingdom that God is establishing, the kingdom that will go on forever and ever. And your works and your prayers and our worship are part of that kingdom and will be remembered down through eternity, and God is glorified in them. But the other encouragement is this, that because God uses the small and the insignificant to do the most glorious, not only are our tiny works part of that one great work of God, but who can tell what God, God has in store for you and for us. Right now, the work might be tiny, and it is. And right now, the effect you feel you're having, and whatever it is that God has called you to do, may feel very small, and it may be just that. But who knows what God will do through you and through us? Oftentimes, our works, our efforts, our prayers are like that mustard seed. Smaller than all of the seeds of the earth. And yet, just as God has done through Jesus Christ, they become great and significant under the prospering of his hand and spirit. We should never believe that we can read history or the future. We should never believe that the way things are now are the way that things will always be, because everything is in the Lord's hands. The tiny thing that we are part of now, 
may just be the thing that God explodes to do breathtaking things with. It doesn't seem that way, does it? Sitting there in a congregation of 10 or 12 people. But who knows, this might be the beginning of the work of reformation here in the city of Sunderland. It might be through your gathering together, through your faithfulness in these early meetings, that God develops multiple local churches within the city of Sunderland that are committed to the reformed faith, are committed to the proclamation of the gospel. It might just be that the city of Sunderland is taken back to its condition at the time of Bede and the monks. There is nothing to stop this from happening. It is all in the Lord's hands. Should the Lord will it, should the Lord send his spirit, he may do it. And so the fact that God works in this way means that we should never lose heart and we should always have faith. We should be bold and optimistic in the work that we have engaged in. And we should pray big prayers, praying that God might do great and wonderful things. And then we should thank him that we get to be part of it in its very small and its very early beginnings. We should never despise the day of small things, for it is often through the small and insignificant that God does the most amazing and glorious of his works. Amen.